All right, now as everybody knows, of course, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and we are celebrating, we will be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, prior to that, um, of course, Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, and what I want to teach on this morning is actually very related to all that, and it's, it, I'm going to be teaching on the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Okay, as, as a Baptist church, we believe that there are two ordinances that we need to keep as New Testament believers. The ordinance of the Lord's Supper and the ordinance of baptism. Those are the two things that we still, that we do follow today. They've been changes to the law. There was the Old Testament law that, that Israel had to keep and uh, many changes were made. Jesus Christ came, he fulfilled the law. I'll get into that a little bit later in the sermon. But one of the things that we need to keep is the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Now, this question has come up uh, previously in this church, and I think it's important that uh, I teach on this every year so that the people understand where we stand as a church. Now, I want to, first of all, just make mention that we are an independent Baptist church, which means that we are truly non-denominational. You say, but wait, you just said you're Baptist. We are Baptist, but we're Baptist because... You know, we baptize people because of our beliefs. It's something that people could recognize as having a certain belief. But there is no organization or head of like, you know, there's a Southern Baptist Convention, which is a denomination. There is a whole group and organization where money flows and they have an authority structure. And if you do not adhere to the things that the, that the convention states, then you will be kicked out and disassociated with the convention. We don't have anything like that. We are solely, completely, 100% independent. Even independent, there's you know, the pastor that sent me out to start this church in Tempe, Arizona. I love the man, great church, great man. We have people visiting from that church today, but we are independent. There may be areas that we believe a little bit different on. And I just want to mention this too, right when we get started, that this is a topic that there is a slight difference in what I believe and what this church believes versus what is taught down there. And you know what? That's fine. It's part of being independent. It doesn't, you know, to me, you know, those churches do whatever they want to do and they love the Lord and they're serving them the way they see fit. And, and you know, every pastor's job is to serve God and, and to preach what they believe to be the truth from the Bible as Jesus Christ being the head of this church. So we are doing that, and, and this is, and, and you know, so take that for what it is. Now, if you if you go to a church and they believe different, hey, follow your pastor's lead, and and you know, um, it doesn't mean you have to believe every single thing that they say. But what I teach and what I believe here is that if people, you know, if you're going to be a part of this church, we do things the way that this church believes. So if you have a different way of doing things, that's fine, but you're not going to do them here within this church. Okay, and I just want to make that clear. And we're, we're gonna, I'm going to teach this morning on what we believe at Word of Truth Baptist Church is the ordinance, how, how we follow the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Now, I'll be completely honest with you. And there's one of the reasons why there are some differences in, in the way people observe the Lord's Supper is because there's not a whole lot of Scripture just teaching, you know, this is what you have to do, this, this, you know, spelling it out to a T of how to observe the Lord's Supper. So there is a little, there's a little bit of room for interpretation there. Now, I think what I believe is right, of course. Otherwise, I wouldn't be teaching it, right? I wouldn't be standing up here and teaching you the Bible if I didn't think it was right. So I'm going to present to you the biblical evidence for why we believe what we believe about the, about the Lord's Supper. And we started off in Exodus chapter 12. I know it's a long chapter, but we also believe it's very important to get the context of everything that we're teaching on. I don't like just yanking one verse out of context and just throwing it out there and then preaching and spending an hour talking about it. We're going to look at the Bible today because this is what we hold up as our authority. And if we're going to believe anything, it's going to come from this book. So we read Exodus chapter 12, and you say, yeah, I thought we were talking about the Lord's Supper, though. We just read all about the Passover. Well, the reason why is because the Passover, I believe the Lord's Supper is a continuation in the New Testament of the observance of the Passover that was instituted in the Old Testament. Now, there's a lot of symbolism that we see here in Exodus chapter 12 regarding the Passover, right? Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ is the lamb of God. Jesus, you know, the, 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 the Old Testament Passover was a picture 
for the people at that time to see and to, and to get the understanding that a Savior was to come. A sacrificial lamb was going to come. We're taught from the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and of goats, they can't take away sin. They never have been able to take away sin. God instituted sacrifices in the Old Testament where they would take the lamb, and, and, and it was very specific and laid out. This is what you need to do. This is the sin, uh, or the, you know, the sacrifice for uh, uh, the sin sacrifice, the, um, all the different various sacrifices that he had. They were all laid out, and they needed to be done. But that did not bring salvation of people's souls ever. Even in the Old Testament, when they had to do those things, it did not save their souls. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4, even as Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. Faith in the Savior, faith in the Lord, faith in Jesus Christ, right? Salvation has always been by faith. So, but they did have these, these ordinances for a reason. And as we read here, this was an ordinance that was supposed to be in effect forever unto the children of Israel. Now, of course, you know, the... the there was a change when Jesus Christ came into law, but we'll get into that. Let's look down here where we started reading in verse number 3 of Exodus chapter 12. The Bible says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Excuse me. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house... Take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. This is a great picture of what actually happened with the true lamb of God. The way that this is laid out, it says on the tenth day you need to take that lamb, it needs to be without blemish. No imperfections. It needs to be a perfect lamb. You need to take the best lamb, right? One that's perfect. Jesus Christ is perfect. He was without sin. He's, you know, this is representative of Jesus Christ. Keep this in mind as we read this. On the 10th day it was taken, and you keep it up until the 14th day. And at the 14th day of the same month, it says, The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. The whole congregation, everybody. Now, you remember when Jesus Christ was standing before Pilate, basically the Jews were gathered together and they said, crucify him, crucify him. Now, mind you, it wasn't just the Pharisees. The Pharisees were kind of leading the group, but it wasn't just the Pharisees at the time. There was a whole group of Jews that were standing there saying, crucify him, crucify him. And this is exactly what happened. The blood of Jesus Christ then was, you know, the responsibility fell upon the Jews, according to the Bible, that they were the ones that killed the Lord Jesus Christ. They were responsible for it. It says in, um, continuing on here, so on the 14th day you kill the lamb, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And he makes a, they make a specific point here. Moses, or God, makes a specific point here in verse 9. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. So he's saying, okay, you can't cook, you can't boil it, you can't use water. He says, you need to have this roast with fire. Why? Because Jesus Christ, the Bible says that Jesus Christ himself said, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. When Jesus Christ was, was crucified on that cross, they buried his body in a tomb. But the Bible says that his soul descended into hell. His soul went to hell. He bare the sins of the whole world in his own body on the tree. And when he died up on that cross, it wasn't over yet. His soul went to hell because, it, I mean, it makes perfect sense. The punishment for our sins, according to the Bible, is hell. That is the punishment for us. That is the, the price that God paid, that God has for our sins. Jesus Christ came to pay for our sins. He died on the cross. He shed his blood. His soul went to hell. 
before, of course, raising again from the dead on the third day. That's where he has the keys of death and hell. He's conquered death and hell. Praise the Lord for that. And he's paid and atoned for all of our sins. He's made the payment for us. The payment we deserve to pay, he made that payment for us. Now, that's why he's saying here, look, you can't use water. It needs to be roast with fire because it's a picture. It's representative of what's going to happen in the future. And God wanted to make sure the picture that was clear. He says, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. And then he instructs them with the blood, verse 13, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So what they were supposed to do with the Passover, especially here, because they were, you were in the land of Egypt, God was delivering them out. The death angel was going to come through and start killing all the firstborn of the land. And God said, okay, those of you that want to be saved from death, you need to take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorposts and above the top of the lintel. And, and it's interesting, when you, when you do the motion, you're making a cross, right? And I thought that was, I've heard someone say that before, and it was real interesting. Now, um, but the whole thing is a picture, right? And we're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ to save us from death, right? Jesus Christ atoned for our sins and he washes us in his blood so that we can be white as snow, so that God can look on us. We don't have iniquity. Now, this is all symbolically you know, referenced here when the blood was, when God, when the death angel comes by to kill, to destroy, oh, look, the blood covers them. Now, were those people still sinners? Yeah, of course they were sinners just like we are today. But the blood covered them and protected them from that destruction. So, this is, you know, this is what the Passover was about. It was representative. And then verse 14 says, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. So he was, I don't want you to forget this day. Because it was a real event. I mean, this, this happened in Egypt when the, when the children of Israel were being uh, led out. And God delivered them from that great, you know, from, from the, the bondage and, and the cruelty that they suffered in Egypt. He led them out. And he says, I don't want you to forget about this because it was purely miraculous. All the plagues that came upon Egypt all the way up until this last day. He says, you need to do this every year. So that way when your kids ask, why do we even do this? You could explain to them, look, the blood of the lamb saved us. And it's that teaching, it's an understanding that we need to have and to keep. So he says, And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Now let's jump to the New Testament. Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 5, Turn if you would to... Turn if you would to Luke 22. Because when the Lord's Supper was instituted, it was with Jesus Christ and his disciples as they were observing Passover. That is when it was instituted. Now, there are a lot of ordinances in the Old Testament, a lot of laws. Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 5, he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So, there are many ordinances, such as the Passover lamb, that Jesus Christ came to fulfill, because there's a lot of things that were, that were just pictures and images of the time then present for them to understand what was to come. Jesus Christ came, and even though there was a change made in the law, he was the fulfillment of all of those things. For example, the Sabbath day. Jesus Christ is our rest. The Sabbath day was observed, but it was an observation of, you know, entering into God's rest. Jesus Christ provides that rest for us. He did all of the work necessary, so when we're in Christ, we are in His rest. That is one of the reasons why we don't have to observe the Sabbath day any longer. It's one of those things that has been fulfilled. It's not abolished. It's fulfilled. There's a difference because the law was there for a very important reason. And once it's fulfilled, then um, you know, the meaning is still there, but we don't observe the same rules anymore. So Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law, and he came and fulfilled this aspect of the Passover because he was the Passover lamb. 
but he instituted a change here. We're going to see here, um, of course, in John 1, 29, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He was the Lamb of God. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the Bible says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So, again, you know, the Bible refers to Jesus Christ in many places as being our Passover, being the Lamb of God. He was the one that came to fulfill all that. And if you understand anything about leaven in the Bible, leaven represents sin. And it's oftentimes referred to as, as being, you know, the leaven of, of the, the Pharisees, the leaven of the doctrine of the Pharisees. And, and leaven is, is used, obviously, for bread to make it rise and things like that. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump, Right? But um, it's referred to in negative context. So the unleavened bread is representative of being sinless. Okay. Now, at the time of the Passover, they did it unleavened because they were in a hurry. They had to get out of there. And he says, you know, you are, they, they didn't even have time to prepare anything. So they had to leave quickly. That was one of the memorials of the Passover. But when we get into the, the New Testament here, you're in Luke chapter 22, right? Look down at verse number 14. We're going to see Luke's uh, account of the Lord's Supper during, um, right here in Luke chapter 22. It says in verse 14, And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, look at this, and he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So he's calling what, you know, what they're doing there. They're, they are acknowledging the Passover. He says, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now I believe that when they were observing the Passover here, the Passover was actually the next day. That they were observing it a day early. And I'm not going to get into all the math behind it but basically, Jesus Christ was representative of being this, the, the sacrificial lamb of God. I believe that when he was crucified at even, when he died on the cross, that is when the Passover started. That is the, the exact time that they were all to be killing the sacrificial lamb for the Passover. And that he was a 100% complete fulfillment of that. So the evening before, when he's with his disciples and they're observing the Passover, it was... It was in advance because he knew his hour was come and he knew that he was going to be the sacrificial lamb. So this is the, you know, just to give you the time of when this is happening, I believe this is happening here. Now, for those of you that believe in Good Friday or been taught about Good Friday, Good Friday is not true. Okay, good, the, 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 Jesus, the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ did not happen on a Friday. Because the Bible says that Jesus Christ was dead for three days and three nights. We know that he was risen on the first day of the week. Now, ju just for convenience sake, I know that the calendar wasn't exactly the same. Okay, so I'm calling it Friday or Sunday or Wednesday or whatever. They didn't use the same names. It doesn't matter. They still had a 24-hour day. They still had, you know, day, you know, seven days in a week. Okay, so it's, we could use our terms for it. I just don't want people to get too hung up with that. We're going to use the, the days that we're familiar with. Okay, so if Jesus Christ was dead for three days and three nights, if he were to have died on a Friday, you could have, you know, it was that evening too. And I'll even give you Friday. Let's just say one of those days that Jesus Christ was in a day was Friday. Well, then you have Friday, you have Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, that's two days and two nights. Even if I give you Sunday as, as another day, that's only three days and two nights. It's not three days and three nights. It's impossible mathematically for him to have been crucified on a Friday. You know, and uh, I mean, if you want to celebrate Good Friday, go ahead and have it, but it's not, it's not scriptural. It's not biblical. I believe he was actually crucified on a Wednesday. And if you're familiar with the, the, you know, kind of the way that the Hebrews did things and the way that even God instituted things, going all the way back to Genesis, the Bible says in the creation, in the evening and the morning were the first day. So the days started in the evening. I mean, we think of it, our days start at midnight, right? 12 a.m. is the beginning of the day. Well, if you bring that back to about 6 p.m., is when their days would start. So it would be the evening, and then the morning was the first day. So the beginning of their day started in the evening. And 
when Jesus Christ was crucified, he was crucified in the evening. So if it was Wednesday night at the evening, you'd have then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday were the three days. And the three nights, of course, were those nights. And it says that when the, the ladies came to the grave on the first day of the week, it was already empty. So I believe on that, that Saturday night at some point is when he re actually resurrected because the tomb was already emptied on the first day of the week. It's not that he had just risen then. It was already done and gone. And he had been gone for who knows how long, right? We don't know the ex actual amount of time. But anyways, that's a little bit of an aside. But we are, and I'm, I'm, the reason why I'm bringing that up though is because we are actually celebrating or, or um, recognizing the ordinance of the Lord's Supper this Wednesday. So we're not doing it today. We're doing it on Wednesday evening because we're going to try to do it as close as possible to, what, to when it was probably instituted here with Jesus Christ. Okay, So this is the reason why we do it. And we, we do the ordinance once a year because I believe it's a continuation of the Passover. And we're going to get into that here a, a little bit deeper. That, that this ordinance of, of observing the Lord's Supper is a continuation of the Passover. Jesus Christ was a Passover lamb. And that we will observe it once a year also. And I'll also kind of explain why some people do it a little bit more frequently. Some people do it less. Whatever. Um, but the reason why we do it this way is because we are just continuing on the Passover here. Um, let's keep reading here in Luke chapter 22. So he says in verse uh, 16, For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table, and truly the Son of Man goeth, as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. Of course, he's talking about Judas Iscariot there. So one other point I want to bring up while we're on this point. Uh, uh, we see here Judas is partaking in the Lord's Supper. Now, there are some people who believe that, you know, there's closed, close, and open uh, communion. Okay, there's all these different terms that, that people have for this. I do not believe in a closed communion. So the way that we will be observing it is we will be offering the bread and the wine, which is it's, it's juice, it's unfermented. Again, you know, the, the unleavened bread here is representing the body of Jesus Christ. If leaven represents sin, you know, and we are supposed to be honoring Jesus Christ when he said, this is my body, which is broken for you, it should be unleavened without sin. It's representative of his body. Now, if we're going to drink a beverage that is representative of the blood of Jesus Christ, as pure as he was, as pure as his blood was, we're using unfermented juice. The fruit of the vine that is unfermented. Because the fermentation, if you know anything about fermentation, it's a yeast, right? There's, it's just as there's a yeast in the, in the, in the um, leaven, in bread, the fermentation process also has that. It, it's basically the same thing. The, the yeast for the bread is very similar to the yeast that you'd use in the, in the juice to make it alcoholic. So, both of those would represent impurities and imperfections in the body and the blood of Jesus. So we use unfermented juice and we use uh, unleavened bread to represent the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why it's, it's in a sense, it's open, we don't, you know, I don't think that people that are unsaved should be partaking in this. And we'll get into that a little bit here when we get into 1 Corinthians. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is like, 1 Corinthians 11 is kind of the main teaching on the Lord's Supper. This is where you're going to find the most. We see in Matthew and Mark and in Luke the way that Jesus Christ and his disciples actually did it. You can see them sitting at the table. And there's not much to it, right? Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood in the new, of the New Testament. You know, and that was it. They took and they ate and, and they sung a hymn and they were done. But what was evident here in Luke 22 is that 
Judas was still among them. Remember, during this time, Judas, Judas was sent out, you know, that thou doest, doest quickly, and he's going to go and betray him. But at this point in the night, Jesus Christ even said, Behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table, after he had given out the, the bread and the wine. So, we don't, because some churches will really restrict and be like, if you are not a member of this church, if you have not been baptized here and a meal and really remember, you cannot partake of this. We do not do that here. We allow you to make the choice for yourself if you believe that you are worthy, as we'll see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, the first part of being worthy is just even being saved. Okay, if you're, I don't believe anybody who's unsaved should be partaking. They're going to be eating and drinking damnation unto themselves. But let's, let's read here in 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 18 is where we're going to start off. The first half of the chapter really doesn't have anything to do with uh, the Lord's Supper. Now, we are actually going through the book of 1 Corinthians on our Wednesday night Bible study. And if you've been coming to these at all, you'll notice that the church at Corinth had a lot of problems. They were doing all kinds of things wrong. And, and chapter after chapter, Paul's kind of going through and setting them straight on many different issues that are happening within the church. Another one of the issues that's going on here is they were not observing the Lord's Supper correctly at all. So we keep this in mind because he's rebuking them and correcting them with his words when we go through and look at this, that the way that they were doing it was not at all correct. So we want to just keep that in mind that um, when we look through this. So he's, he's kind of rebuking them and, and correcting them here. Verse 18, he says, For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. He's already starting off saying, Look, I know that there's divisions among you. I've already heard about it. And this was the church. They were saying, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. And they all were kind of getting behind the whatever guys they wanted to. They were not unified as a church. And there was false doctrine coming in. He says, there must be also heresies among you. He knew there was heresies among this church. So now he's going to set them straight here. Verse number 20. When ye come together, therefore, into one place... This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And I've heard it taught that, okay, this verse right here, where he says that we're all congregated in one place, so you should not be partaking of the Lord's Supper in church. But this is why I don't want to just yank one verse out. Let's read the whole chapter and kind of get an understanding of what he's referring to. Because if you look down to verse 33... After he does all this explanation, he says, Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. So he's saying, at first, you know, and we know there's no contradictions in the Bible. Lord, you know, the, the, the Bible doesn't just contradict itself. So he said, when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. But then when you do come together to eat, you know, what is it? Are we coming together to eat or are we not coming together to eat? So let's read it. He explains that in verse 21 because he said, This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For. So because of what you're doing here. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. So first of all, they're not waiting for each other. They're just going in and they're just, they're just eating. They're chowing down. Now, the Lord's Supper, when Jesus Christ gave bread and wine, that's not a full meal. This isn't just like we're going, we're going to have dinner, and everyone's just going to sit down and eat. Like last night, we had our game night, and it was a lot of fun. And we had pizza and wings and snacks and all this other stuff. We came together and we ate. And people, you know, I mean, and I told people, bring your appetite. Come hungry to this, right? This is something that we are eating. But the Lord's Supper, and you'll see here as we go through this, it's not something that you come to just hungry and expecting to have a meal when we observe the Lord's Supper. It's not a dinner. Because he says, look, when you eat, everyone takes before his other's own supper, and one's hungry and another's drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Look, look, when you're hungry, eat at home. 
Look, eat before you come to church. Eat before you get here. Eat before we observe the Lord's Supper. And you don't have to, you know, one person's going to be hungry and just diving in and eating the food. And another person's drunk. And look, that is not the way things need to operate in the house of God. Verse 23, he says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. So now Paul's going to give them the teaching of what he received from the Lord. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. So the memorial of Jesus Christ is him taking the bread and literally breaking it, physically breaking it so they could see, this is you know, my body's broken for you. We're taking my bread, and that's another reason why we don't eat like little pre-cut wafers or anything. Because the symbolism is lost when you use a perfect little square or a perfect circle, whatever it is. Because he's saying, look, this is broken. So the, 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 the bread that we eat when we observe is going to be broken. We we'll break the unleavened bread so that the symbolism isn't lost there because we're doing this in remembrance of Christ. It's in memorial. So we know, hey, this is broken bread which represents the body of Jesus Christ. After the same manner, verse 25, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So this verse right here is one of the reasons why people will um, want to observe the Lord's Supper more frequently because it says for as often as you do it, right? It doesn't mean that, that you have to do it, you know, and, and there's not a, any strict requirement on this. You're not seeing a very, very clear teaching of, and you only can do this once a year or you, you have to do this multiple times or every week or whatever. But for as often as you do, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, I mean, this is in effect until the Lord comes back again. He says, you show the Lord's death until he come. So for as often as we do it, which is every year, every time we do this, we are showing the Lord's death until he come. And the reason why we do it once a year is because we do it just a continuation of the Passover. So um, it says in verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the blood, the body, and the blood of the Lord. Now, I'm going to pause right here. I'm going to get into this in just a minute because I want to explain just one more thing about the Lord's Supper and why we believe we do come together as a church to recognize this. It's not a full meal. The Passover, when the, when the children of Israel did the Passover, they took and separated according to the eating of a lamb. So whether it be one, if you have a bigger household, a bigger family, and everyone can eat that lamb, they would all go into one house. But if there is maybe only like, like a young married couple or whatever, a smaller family, then you would get a few houses together. And it was all according to the eating of the lamb is the way that they broke up into those groups. Now, our observance of the Lord's Supper does not include a lamb at all. The lamb sacrifice was done when the children of Israel were actually still in Egypt. And they, and they did the eating of the lamb. Jesus Christ has fulfilled that aspect of the Passover 100% completely. That has been done away, which is why a lamb has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper that we, honor, that we look at now. But the unleavened bread was still a part of the Passover because they had to eat unleavened bread for seven days. And that was when they were pushed out of Egypt. And guess what? When they left their houses... They became one big congregation. They were all together in one place as they were migrating out of Egypt. And they had, for those seven days, is when they're eating that unleavened bread. So they were eating the unleavened bread as a group. And I believe that when we get together and we recognize and we are doing honor and showing the Lord's death until He's come, we get together here and we, we break the, the bread and drink the cup. It's not a full-blown supper. It's not a full-blown meal. You don't come here hungry expecting to get, get food you know, and, and get fed and, and, and be satisfied by eating a piece of bread and drinking a little bit of, of juice. Okay? It's supposed to be done in, in remembrance and it's a solemn event it's, it's, you know, giving honor and respect and remembrance unto what Christ did for us. So 
when we see here in verse number 27, wherefore whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of, this, of the, uh, this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So when it says unworthily there, I believe there's kind of a dual meaning here. The first and primary is that, you know, we're worthy only because we're saved, because Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins. So if you're eating and drinking unworthily, if you're under, eating and drinking unsaved, then you're bringing damnation upon yourself. You're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. He says in verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So we offer the communion to anybody that's here. Now, and when we do it on Wednesday, I'll give another brief explanation just saying, Hey, look, it's up to you, just as it was up to Judas. Judas was unsaved, but Jesus offered it to all of the disciples at that time. So you have to examine yourself. Is this right for me to partake in? He says, And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, the reason why I think there's a dual meaning there, it's not just about salvation. And some people teach that, and that's just fine, that's just about salvation, is because he's talking to the church here. He says, examine yourself. And then in verse 30, he says, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. I think when we observe the Lord's Supper, because it's a solemn event, because we're recognizing the death of Jesus Christ, that we ought to get ourselves to a, prepared to be at a place to where, hey, this is kind of a big deal. We're honoring and we're partaking of the, the, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to make sure I don't have any like blaring sin in my life, that I'm going to come here with respect and be at a place to where, okay, I'm going to partake with the body and blood of Christ and deal with it as a big deal and not just whatever, yeah, I was just out at the bar last night, I'm going to come in, I'm going to partake of, of the body and blood of Christ. Right? We need to, to analyze ourselves. He says, because for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. This is a chastisement of God upon believers. God's not going to be chastising the unbelievers in the way of just making them weak and sickly among you because they need to get saved first. I mean, that's, they, they're going to have their judgment of hell. And that's why you can see in this world so many wicked people that are unsaved that it seems like God's not judging them at all. Because he's not. Because they have a judgment coming and they're going to get way more than, than anything they could receive here on this earth. But as a believer, as a child of God, guess what? When you start doing wrong, he's going to chastise you and he's going to discipline you because it's for your benefit. And some people, if you're saved and you just really kind of are rebellious towards God, he could even take your life from you and just end your life early. And we've seen that even in the book of Acts, um, with Ananias and Sapphira, when they, when they brought forth the, 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 they claimed that it was everything that they, you know, they're bringing everything that they sold from their property, but they held some back for themselves, they fell down dead. Now, I believe that they were saved. The Bible says they gave up the ghost. I believe that they were saved, but um, it was a punishment for them for, for committing that sin. And he says here in verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Paul's including himself in the we. Paul was saved, and I think he's, he's primarily speaking to a saved church. Now, of course, it's possible it's unsaved. At any church, there could be unsaved people in it, but that's not the point of church. The point of church is for saved believers to come and to, and to hear the word of God and to sing praises to his name. Church is for believers. It's not for the unsaved. And then he says in verse 32, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. God doesn't chasten the unbelievers because they're bastards and not sons, the Bible says. You're chastened for your correction. So I believe that when he says here, examine yourself, there's people in your church that are weak and sickly because they're not discerning the Lord's body. They're not, they're not treating it with enough respect. They're not getting their hearts right with the Lord when they partake of this. And he says, look, you need to just examine yourself. And this is the way that we observe it here is we examine ourselves and that's why I'm doing it a little bit early. I probably should have done it last week, but I'm teaching on it this Sunday. Just to give you a little bit of time, we're going to be observing it on Wednesday. We will be taking, partaking of the body and the blood of Christ figuratively through the bread and the, and the, and the juice. And it says, um, 
Then in verse 33, Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order. So he says, look, when you come together to eat, to eat what? To eat the Lord's Supper. Wait for each other, and if you're hungry, hey, eat at home. Don't come here hungry. You know, be satisfied so that you're, you're, you're thinking about the right thing, that you're ready to partake in the Lord's Supper, which is not this full meal. It's just eating and drinking of, um, in, in remembrance. Now, the last place I'll be turned is Numbers chapter 9. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers chapter 9. I try to prove everything that we believe here from Scripture, from the Bible. Because it's not just on a whim. right? We don't just come up with stuff to believe just because, well, I think this sounds good. Or it's just what I, what I think. I try to back everything up with Scripture. So the last thing I want to point out here too with the unworthiness part, just to give a little bit more proof with it, with it, it's not just, um, well, it sounds kind of good. With the unworthily part, it was also similar in the Old Testament with observing the Passover. We're going to see an example of someone who was defiled by touching a dead body. Okay, In order to um, participate in the ordinances of the Old Testament, you had to be clean, you had to be pure. You had, you know, there's a lot of things that can make a person unclean. One of them was, hey, if you, if you end up touching a dead body, you're supposed to be unclean. You need to wash yourself. And there's all these things. And if someone died on the day that you're observing Passover, right? Obviously, there's nothing you could do about it. It's not that you're sinning, but you have become unclean. And God was very, very careful of saying, look, you need to be clean to do this stuff. And he made provision for certain events to take place so that somebody can be clean and still partake of the Passover. So we'll read that in Numbers chapter 9, verse number 5. The Bible says, And they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month at even in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. So the Passover was supposed to be kept. We could call it January, right? The first month. January 14th. That's when the Passover was supposed to be kept, right? According to our calendar. It's not the same as the Jewish calendar. And there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and before Aaron on that day. And those men said unto him, We are defiled by the dead body of a man. Wherefore are we kept back, that we may not offer an offering of the Lord in his appointed season among the children of Israel? And Moses said unto them, Stand still, and I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. So Moses says, Okay, hold on here a minute. I'm going to go ask God about this. Because the Passover is a big deal. It's a very big deal. And the whole congregation is expected to partake in the Passover. And that you, this is something that everybody had to do. So they're saying, Okay, look, Moses, we're unclean because of the, you know, someone died and we had to deal with his dead body. What should we do about this, though? Should we, are we still prevented from partaking in the Passover? Like we don't, want, we don't want to sin here, basically. You know, God said that we're supposed to be doing this, but we're unclean. What should we do? So Moses goes to God. It says in verse 9, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you or of your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover And the Lord. So he's saying, look, I still want him to keep the Passover. But look what he does. Verse 11, The fourteenth day of the second month at even, they shall keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So he, put, he, he makes it a month later. Instead of the first month, now it's the second month. The same day, but it's the it's second month now. He gives them time to make sure, okay, now you're going to observe it in the second month and make sure you're clean and ready for that. He says, they shall leave none of it until the morning. It's the same rules, nor break any bone of it. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. But the man that is clean and is not in a journey, he's saying, okay, but, it, but if, if, you, if, you, if you have not one of these problems, no reason for you not to keep the Passover and forbear it to keep the Passover. Even the same soul shall be cut off from among his people because he brought not the offering of the Lord in his appointed season. That man shall bear his sin. So obviously it was an, it was an important um, ordinance to keep the Passover. He's saying, look, you're in sin if you're not doing it, if there's no reason why you can't. But if you can't do it because you're unclean, 
I still want you to do it. You're just going to do it later. So when the Bible's saying here, look, when we're taking the Lord's Supper, we're observing it. Unworthily. Make sure that you are clean. Okay? And I'm not talking about a dead body, but you, know, you, can, you can take that how you will as far as what you consider to be clean. Now, there's a lot of major sins in the Bible. Obviously, we know that we can never be without sin while we're in this flesh. And that is clearly taught throughout the Bible. But there is also a level of righteousness that we can be living to where God can look at that and say, you're living a righteous life. Even though he knows we're not perfect. He, he lifted Job up as an example. Look, He's a perfect and upright man. Now, was, does that mean Job didn't sin? Of course not. Of course not. He's a, he a human being. He's a sinner. But he was walking upright and doing things and living, and living a life, you know, to the best of his ability, not in all these major sins that the Bible talks about. He was living righteously. And that's the way that we ought to be and prepare ourselves and prepare our hearts so that when we come to partake of the body and blood of Jesus Christ that we can be considered worthy. One, because we're saved, obviously, and two, because we're not just, just off into, into rebellion and sin and that we've prepared ourselves for this event. So I wanted to make sure that, that we're a little bit cleared up. If you have any questions about this further that I didn't cover in the sermon this morning, Please just come to me. I'm always available. Talk to me after the service. Talk to me whenever. And um, I'd be more than happy to clear it up. But uh, we observe it once a year here at Word of Truth Baptist Church. And it's going to be this Wednesday. So if you'd like to become as part of the church and participate, you are welcome to do so. And it'll be just following the service on Wednesday night. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. Um, for giving us the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, a time for us to reflect. We know that we should always be uh, mindful of the sacrifice that you made for us, dear God. We know that it's something that we should never forget about from day to day. But it's also important to be able to set apart a, a day, set apart some time for us to really soberly just come before you and to, and to recognize and to take that extra time to honor you and, and the sacrifice that you made for us, dear Lord. We are so incredibly thankful for that. God, I pray that you please help us to show our thankfulness for your free gift when we go out today and try to preach the gospel to other people, dear Lord, that they might receive the free gift, that they might receive the salvation that you've offered yourself for to them, dear God. And I pray that you would please just work through our church, continue to, to, to build this church and help us to grow, dear Lord, that we can ultimately just do the most most work for you as possible and bring honor and glory unto your name. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.